Hello everyone, it's Sejin. Welcome. Today I'd like to discuss the recently Oscar-nominated film The Dawn of Interest. I chose to talk about this film because to me it has been long awaited. As someone profoundly intrigued by Hannah Arendt's book Ahmed in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, and her later work, I've always imagined seeing a film that truly articulates her rather abstract thoughts. Then came The Dawn of Interest, directed by Jonathan Glazer. I believe the film really did a good job in fulfilling the task of providing a haunting visualization of the concept of the banality of evil. It narrates the story of Rudolf Haas, the Auschwitz camp commandment, and his wife Hedwig, as they strive to create their ideal family life in a home situated just outside the gates of the Auschwitz concentration camp. The film really delved deeply into the meticulous, infinite details of the unsettling ordinariness within the context of profound evil. It brought the audience to the brink of terror and discomfort within that normality. So let's dive right in and explore what this powerful film brings to the table. I'll start by discussing the intellectual background of the banality of evil, then I'll talk about how the film addressed this concept, and next, I'll share some thoughts on how we can think about these ideas in our daily lives. Lastly, I'll explain one disappointment I have regarding the film. As always, you'll find links to all the relevant readings and films down below in the description box. A shout out to my friend Zach for recommending this film to me and Queen, my movie watching partner in crime. Thanks a ton, you guys. So let's jump right in. Before talking about Hannah Arendt, we need to start from our traditional portrayal of bad people. Traditionally, we depict evil people as a small group of sinister individuals who are fundamentally different from the norm and from the average person. Consider Lord Voldemort from J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter series. He's a dark wizard characterized by a fanatical ideology. Unlike most people, he doesn't have a family or intimate relationships. Every day, he's just completely fixated on purifying the wizarding race and achieving immortality. His cruelty is blatantly obvious in his use of sadistic punishments, and it's clear that he takes pleasure in such acts. Also, his appearance is equally unsettling. He has snake-like features that apparently reflect his departure from common humanity. Most importantly, it's Voldemort's exceptional talent. He possesses abilities that far exceed those of the average witch or wizard. His deep mastery of dark magic, encompassing a wide range of spells, curses, and other malevolent practices, distinctly sets him apart from other characters in the series. This characterization reflects an old belief about evil figures being abnormal monsters. Such a portrayal has two implications. Firstly, it suggests that extreme evil individuals are inherently different from us. It's out of the ordinary. They possess a distinct inherently wicked nature. In literature and films, this extreme deviation from the norm is often used as a symbol of ultimate evil and power. This portrayal can be strangely comforting, as it allows us to differentiate ourselves from these characters. We as hard-working, law-abiding, regular folks can thus maintain a collective sense of innocence through this us versus them narrative. Secondly, it implies that ultimate evil can be great in its own right, resembling a malevolent genius. These characters are often portrayed as being as profound and talented as their good counterparts, if not more so. This adds a layer of complexity to the concept of evil, suggesting that it's not just about malevolence, but also about a certain level of exceptionalism and excellence. Hannah Arendt is actually the philosopher who most famously dismantled this whole paradigm of how we think about and understand the nature of evil. In 1960, Hannah Arendt, a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany, learned about the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann had been a Nazi official, deeply involved in the Holocaust, and was on the verge of standing trial in Jerusalem. Arendt reached out to William Shang, 
who was the editor of the New Yorker at the time, and successfully persuaded him to send her to Jerusalem as a reporter. While there, she attended Eichmann's 1961 trial and meticulously documented her observations. These insights were initially published as articles in the New Yorker and were subsequently expanded into her 1963 book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. Contrary to popular assumption, the conversation did not stop there. In fact, this experience profoundly influenced Aaron's philosophy for the rest of her life. In her report and later reflections in the life of the mind, Arndt noted that Eichmann, contrary to popular assumptions of him as a perverted monster, had appeared as a mediocre and thoughtless bureaucrat. She said, I was stuck by a manifest shallowness in the door. The deeds were monstrous, but the doer, at least the very effective one now on trial, was quite ordinary, commonplace, and neither demonic nor monstrous. Despite all the effort of the persecution, everybody could see that this man was not a monster, but it was difficult indeed not to suspect that he was a clown. What made Hannah Arendt's point very controversial to this day was that she believed Eichmann hadn't displayed fanatical adherence to Nazi ideology. She said, except for an extraordinary diligence in looking out for his personal advancement, he had no motives at all. His case was obviously also no case of insane hatred of Jews, of fanatical anti-Semitism or indoctrination of any kind. Arendt suggested that Eichmann's main drive was his career advancement, not ideological belief or moral conviction. His extraordinary diligence in pursuing personal goals indicated ambition that was self-centered and bureaucratic, not driven by a broader ideological agenda. Don't get her wrong, for Arendt, there was no question that Eichmann was responsible for the atrocity. His crime was hideous. Her point was that he was neither diabolically abnormal nor intellectually superior, as people usually assumed. Now, compare this case study with the example of Voldemort in Harry Potter. Arendt's description of this type of evil person can make us feel very uncomfortable because we can no longer easily identify evil with individuals that are radically different from the norm or from us. You know, most people have the basic desire to see themselves as morally upright persons. I work very hard, have a family, and look normal, thus I automatically belong to the good ones, right? Arendt is the one who says, wait a minute, see? Under certain circumstances, ordinary people could be capable of participating in great atrocities as well. Her idea indeed disturbed many people's moral complacency. As Arndt pointed out, they knew, of course, that it would have been very comforting indeed to believe that Eichmann was a monster. The trouble with Eichmann was precisely that so many were like him, and that the many were neither perverted nor sadistic, that they were and still are terribly and terrifyingly normal. For Aaron, Eichmann's defining characteristic was his lack of thought and complacency in failing to reflect. She argued that his brand of evil was not rooted in greatness, but was rather shallow and bland. This aroused from an absence of critical thinking and self-reflection. In essence, his thoughtlessness was what facilitated his significant role in the Holocaust. Despite his unremarkable intellect and motives, Eichmann's critical failure in ethical thinking enabled his immense evil. So now let's delve into the film itself. Jonathan Glazer took on a challenging task of depicting the Nazis and their unfathomable atrocities. Perhaps his experimental approach can inspire more representations of banal villains in cinema and art forms in the future. The film opened with the portrayal of, of an ordinary and affluent German family that led a well-ordered life. The couple was hardworking, with the husband going to work every day, the wife meticulously managing a large house, uh, an extensive garden, and a beautiful swimming pool. These scenes depicted the typical image of domestic life characterized by a busy, routine, and somewhat bland atmosphere. It couldn't have been more normal. However, this apparent normal life 
was sharply contrasted with the harsh reality of the Holocaust that unfolded just beyond their home, where adults in the household were actively involved. The house was separated from the concentration camp by only a high brick wall. The constant presence of smokestacks, faint screams of victims, gunshots, and the smoke and the orange glow from the cemetery ovens contributed to an increasingly unsettling atmosphere. Rudolf Haas, the father in the family and the Auschwitz camp commandant, participated in meetings with co-workers to make the camp ovens more efficient. These ovens were a reference to the crematoriums used in the Holocaust for mass extermination. This was one instance where the disturbance became extreme. In a typical setting, adults who were serious, hardworking, and focused on rational efficiency and practical matters were often regarded as noble and morally upright. This perception was based on widely held beliefs that equated such traits with responsibility, dedication, and a strong work ethic. However, in the context of the Holocaust, these qualities were applied to the logistical organization of mass murder, making it one of the history's greatest atrocities. The film was rife with such contradictions between the expected behaviors derived from their mundane activities and the actual behavior and discussion of the characters. For instance, what would typically be considered a warm gesture like the husband bringing home items and the wife happily distributing them to other family members took a chilling turn when it was revealed that these items were belongings taken from the prisoners. Other unsettling events included the wife applying lipstick taken from the coat of a Holocaust victim in front of her bedroom mirror, and giggling when referred to as the Queen of Auschwitz. As the film progressed, these small yet disturbing details accumulated gradually intensifying the discomfort and leading the audience to confront the unimaginable horror. One of the most disturbing moments in the film to me occurred when Hedwig confronted Rudolf and insisted on not relocating their family from Auschwitz. She adamantly refused to leave the beautiful home she had created for herself. To her, Auschwitz, dear Auschwitz, represented a paradise the perfect place to raise their family. There was certainly nothing ordinary about referring to one's home near a death camp as a dream place. Many boundaries needed to be crossed to maintain undisturbed by muffled gunshots, the scream of victims, and atrocities just on the other side of the wall. Her sincerity and passion were bone chilling. I remember thinking to myself in the theater, this is the moment of evil. If that's not a villain, I don't know who is. Once again, her evil was not distant or grandiose. She was not a stereotypical calculating sadistic genius. The wickedness did not arise from ideological fanaticism, but from a commonly shared, understandable desire to own a beautiful home and have a perfect family. This leads to my first point about the ethical and political dangers inherent in our current achievement society. In my last video, I talked about how we are currently living in what philosopher Byung Chul Han calls an achievement society. This society doesn't just encourage but expects us to perpetually aim for improvement and excellence. This unrelenting emphasis on achieving success which is deeply molded by social norms, can lead to expressed or quiet feelings of worthlessness. After all, the flip side of ambition is often a sense of inadequacy, isn't it? I argue that one direct consequence of living in such an achievement-oriented society is a deterioration of our relationship with ourselves. This encompasses a profound and widespread desire to be rid of our current selves and become someone else a phenomenon Kierkegaard would frame as despair. Another danger inherent in our current achievement society 
is the possibility for profound ethical and social failures due to our hyperfixations on personal goals and subsequent diminution of connection to others. Both Hannah Arendt's philosophy and the film The Zone of Interest emphasize the fact that monstrosity and evil deeds do not necessarily stem from overly criminal motives such as a thirst for blood. Instead, they can originate from very mundane and relatable motivations, such as Rudolf's ambition to advance in his career or Hedwig's quest for the perfect house. While it is perfectly justifiable for individuals to pursue aspirations such as landing a dream job, starting a family, or achieving other significant life milestones, the risk arises when these normal yearnings become so extreme that they lead to total moral blindness and indifference to their neighbor's suffering. In the dawn of interest, the word neighbor took on a very literal and physical meaning. These works means to challenge our moral complacency and call for a deeper level of self-scrutiny in this achievement society. In my last video, I discussed methods for re-establishing a relationship with oneself, which included two exercises and engaging what Kieran Satir refers to as italic activities. I do believe that by actively re-establishing that connection with oneself, there is also the potential to nurture one's moral sensibility that's already inside of us. The most fascinating aspect I observed in the film was how dysfunctional their family relationships were. Whether it was between Rudolf and Hedwig, Hedwig and her mother Lina, or between the children and adults, genuine and open-minded conversations were conspicuously absent. In Hannah Arendt's book, The Life of the Mind, she told the readers that she was struck by the profound shallowness in Eichmann. The film portrays a similar shallowness in Hedwig's character. Beyond superficial matters like requesting her husband to take her to the spa in Italy and issuing orders to the children, she basically avoids engaging in conversations about deep feelings and reflections and ideas. Any attempt at an honest and in-depth conversation met with resistance from her. In dysfunctional relationships, shallow conversations act as both a symptom and a maintenance mechanism. When individuals in a relationship resort to shallow conversations, it's frequently a strategy, whether conscious or not, to avoid confronting deeper issues in life. This point was made clear when Rudolf reveals that during a significant Nazi gathering, he found himself preoccupied with thoughts of gassing everyone in the rooms with high ceilings. Hedwig quickly ends this alarming conversation by stating, well, it's the middle of the night and I need to go to bed, thus avoiding any genuine engagement with the content of Rudolf's thoughts. This is what I appreciated the most about the film. Its deep dive into themes such as shallowness, dysfunctional relationships, and the wider implications of societal atrocities and individual complicity. Hedwig's character in particular embodies a profound inability to love, both within her family and in her political complicity with the Nazi government. Her vanity, superficiality, craving for power, and most critically, her steadfast avoidance of any profound self-reflection or meaningful dialogue are depicted with stark clarity. This portrayal is effective in demonstrating how a lifestyle marked by emotional detachment and a lack of introspection at the individual level can facilitate a collective desensitization to cruelty and injustice. You see, the more I talk about Hedwig, the less I'm satisfied with the film's treatment of Rudolf. While the film attempted to portray the unfathomable evil committed by the most banal and thoughtless bureaucrat, it surprisingly lacked in character development for Rudolf compared to Hedwig. It's important to remember that Rudolf Haas was the commandment of the Auschwitz concentration extermination camp complex from 1940 to 1945, where he personally oversaw the extermination of approximately 1.1 million people. His role involved in the logistical planning and execution of mass extermination, including the selection of gas chamber technologies and the disposal of bodies. This position did not merely require work efficiency, but a profound detachment from the humanity of the victims. 
and it's disappointing that the film failed to adequately portray the actual Nazi commandment, but instead focused on his wife as the epitome of the banality of evil. Yes, in the film, there were attempts to explore Rudolph's character, like when he was shocked by finding a bone fragment in a river, or he tried to vomit toward the end but couldn't. These moments seem to just skim the surface of his character, focusing on the trivial aspects rather than the more disturbing aspect of this person. The concept of banality of evil, outlined by Hannah Arendt through observation of Eichmann, emphasizes the persistent resistance of moral reflection, shallowness, and vanity, which the film didn't fully capture with Rudolph. When you compare this to how Hedwig is portrayed, there is a noticeable gap. Hedwig's actions and remarks, such as her laughter when she was referred to as the Queen of Auschwitz, are given much more depth. This inconsistency in character development is puzzling and somewhat deludes the film's attempt to probe to the nature of evil. At some point, it almost seems to me that the director lessens the seriousness of Rudolph's actions. So here are my thoughts on the film. I'm Sijin Yan, a philosophical counselor. Thank you for watching this film. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye.